So welcome to class two of the Orthodox Boot Camp it's a continuation of Vespers, um, but we're going to talk about it from a particular point of view because Vespers has a dominant theme, just like most of the services do. So I think it would be good for us to take a look at that. All right, so let's pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Illumine our hearts, O Lord Jesus Christ, our God, with the pure light of thy divine knowledge, implant in us also the fear of thy blessed commandments of trampling down all carnal desires. We may enter a spiritual manner of living, both thinking and doing such things as well pleasing unto thee. For thou art the illumination of our souls and bodies, O Christ our God, unto thee we ascribe glory, together with thine originate Father, and thine all holy and life giving spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Amen. All right, so as I was saying, last week we had that beautiful psalm that we read, Psalm 103, which is what we use to introduce the service of Vespers. Every Vesper service that we do, whether it's a high service or a low service, has that psalm in, okay? In addition to that, it also has what we're going to read today. But I want to make a little bit of a transition thematically when you look at Vespers, because you have that psalm and it talks about, you know, um, in wisdom, O God, hast thou made them all. That is a point that when God created the world, it was good, right? It was good. So that's the point from which we start, the creation of all things, okay? So it's before the fall. And so when we hear all of that, that's the, the main theme that we have at the very beginning of Vespers, okay? But then almost immediately we go to something else. Because if you take a look at the first stories of Genesis, so we have all the creation that God created, the light and the dark, the water, the dry, the animals, green grass, herbs, fruit to eat, all of that, people. But then you get the second story where humans get a little bit more detail. And they talk about Adam and then Adam's lonely, so God knocks him out, removes a rib, and creates Eve, okay? Um, and then almost immediately after that, as soon as Adam's like, yay, I have a wife, then the serpent comes. Now, the serpent is the most subtle of all God's creatures, it says, right? And what does he do? He tricks him into eating something we weren't supposed to eat, okay? And what happens as a result? Well, what happens as a result is this if you look at those pages that are in front of you it is the expulsion from eden okay um that what we have in this icon is an angel driving adam and eve out of the garden of eden okay and so we have this um this is now our situation in life okay we are stuck now not in the Garden of Eden, but instead we are in a position where we have to fight for everything. Now, we have done a really good job as human beings in learning how to not fight for what we need. Okay. Hungry? Great. Go to Giant Eagle. Okay. And if that doesn't work out for you, how about McDonald's? Okay. And if that doesn't work out for you, how about Sony's? And if that doesn't work out, how about sparkles or whatever okay just keep adding to the list all these walmart meaning we have all these opportunities to do that okay are we lacking clothes go back to walmart okay just throw some on and you're all good um whatever it is that you need we've found a way to do it but in this day adam and eve and their progeny they had to work with the soil. They had to fight with the soil. They had weeds that they had to counter against. They had animals that liked to eat them. So you have all this violence and all this, uh, you know, negativity. Okay. Well, um, that is echoed in the um, account of the next thing that we're going to take a look at. All right. Um, which is a psalm. So just to let you know the structure of Vespers a little bit, we have Psalm 103 that we've already talked about yes, uh, last week, but then we have what we call a litany or ectania. It's the same ectania that we do at the very beginning of the divine liturgy. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Uh, for the peace from above and the salvation of our souls, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the good state of the Holy Church of God, 
and go going on and on and on. It's a it's a it's a very broad start and it continues to narrow down and down and down as we get into more specifics. Um, in that Actania, also remember, and we'll talk about this in greater detail in the Divine Liturgy, but in that um, Actania, we also pray for um, our Metropolitan. We pray for the President of the United States and all civil authorities. We pray for the city in which we dwell. We pray for healthful seasons, okay? Because even though we can count on Giant Eagle and Sparkle to provide our food, sorry, Dave, save a lot too. Um, it, as long as we have those things that we can depend on, right? But what happens if there's a famine in the middle of this country? Well, we have a gas shortage, but other than that, you know, we depend on agriculture even to this day. And if they have a bad year, it's not likely that they will just given the way that they do things these days. But if they are, well, then we're in trouble. All right. So we pray that God will deliver us from that kind of trouble. Right. Then we pray for travelers, um, for health, for the sick, the suffering and captives. We pray for everybody. OK. And that is part of that Actania. It's again a constant narrowing as we get into a position where we can just leave that all up to God. And then we can focus on what it is that we're trying to do, which is pray to God. OK. So once we've completed that, then we go to this. And it's not really a, a hymn or a psalm of groaning so much, but it is kind of, okay? And we'll talk about this at greater depth in a second, okay? But I'm going to just go ahead and read this. Um, and um, we're not going to sing it in church. Well, yeah, I'll sing the first line. Um, Where are you? Where are um, you? At the very beginning of okay. at the top of O oh, Lord, I have cried. Okay. So this is in tone, tone one. Um, this is something that's become the Vespers. You'll hear maybe um, this version, or there are seven other versions that you can hear of seven different settings to this particular thing, depending on what hymn setting you're singing through the course of that Saturday and Sunday. So this is one. Oh, Lord, I have cried out unto thee. Hear thou me, hear thou me, O Lord. O Lord, I have cried out unto thee, hear thou me, give to the voice of my supplication when I cry out unto thee hear thou me O Lord okay so that's basically the setting for what we sing and like I said there are seven other different versions that you could hear but looking at the words that are there okay it's not i have called out oh lord i have spoken oh lord I, it's cried it's cried out to thee okay and we're begging god to hear us why because we're alone we're estranged from him this is the old testament situation okay they left a paradise of plenty and look at their faces in the icon that we see there. Look at their faces. Look at how they, I mean, think about having it all, having it all. And all of a sudden, because of your transgression, it's gone. Okay. So that's part of the reality of their situation. Now let's talk about that a little bit before we continue on in the sound. Of course. Is this supposed to be an angel? Is that that an angel? is a seraph. Okay, so it's a different kind of angel. It's a different kind okay. of angel. So you see two different right. angels in this. The red creature is, um, well, actually, let's look at that. Um, we talked about that last week, and it was. It's like Garden oh, Paradise, right? That's right. I want to look at that real quick because it may, I can't remember if it's a seraph or a cherubim. So I'm going to look. Yeah, like a big 
at least ones I've seen, like a big, uh, like there's lions with wings or I can't remember what they're those, those little ones up in the circle on the altar, like on a staff. Mm -hmm. Right. Is that it? That's give me one. That's what reminds me of it. It's a cherub. So that's cherubim. All right. So, um, so it's similar to the ones that we see, but it's it's different. That's why it's there are many eyes, the eyes all over the wings and things. Yeah, that's um, so um, it's one of the two places where cherubs are mentioned. The other is um, in the prophecy of Ezekiel. So Adam and Eve are beguiled by the serpent. They eat the apple and immediately become aware of their physical world. They are they perceive that they are naked. And they immediately do something about it. I mean, her husband and wife, they shouldn't care, but they do because they had never seen that before. So they sew up fig leaves and they make themselves all nice and modest and they hide in front of God because they're ashamed. So God sees them, says, what have you done? Have you done the thing I told you not to do? And as a result, all these things start to happen. But what really happens and is the most important point in terms of what it is that we're wrestling with for our purposes what has happened is the earth has been wounded okay just as we have been wounded as humans because our wound comes from the fact that we're not immortal anymore okay we get hurt we die we get cancer bad things happen you know all of this is a result of the fall okay theologically speaking historically there are all sorts of different things that could disagree, but from the theological perspective, what Adam and Eve did and the resulting um, activities they did, they wounded themselves and all of creation, all right? So it's important for us to bear in mind that creation itself is not evil, okay? Creation itself is wounded just like we are, but it is not evil. Some people despise the world for whatever reason and say, I can't wait to be free of the world and, you know, be in heaven. Well, heaven is, what does our Lord say in Revelation? But a new, you know, behold, I see a new heaven and a new earth. Okay. And so what is here becomes restored into what it's supposed to be back into the way it was before the fall. Right. So when we think of the groaning, the groaning isn't just people. It's all of creation, right? All of creation is yearning to be returned to the way that things were right? with Adam and Eve before the fall. So when we hear this, oh Lord, I have cried unto thee, we understand that that is a way of expressing our desire. Oh Lord, how long until you come and save us? How long must we toil and suffer and face all of this adversity, right? And so that's that's part of all of this, but it's really, really important for us, especially in the Orthodox world, to realize that that is the fall. The fall is that the world itself breaks, it gets wounded, and so do we, okay? We are not born sinners. Even to this day, we are not born sinners. We're born broken, we're born wounded, okay? It hurts to be born. Not that I remember, but, you know, hurts to give birth. So you have all of that. And and so you start that way and you spend your whole life in toil and struggle and so on. And so we yearn to be healed of that. Okay. And that's an essence of what Vespers is all about. Okay. So I'm going to move people this one so what i just sang was the first line of oh lord i have cried and then right underneath that let my prayer be set before thee as incense and lifting up my hands as an evening sacrifice now what i'm reading to you is all of psalm 140 according to the orthodox numbering of um the, he, the of the um the psalms Remember, the Hebrew numbering and the Orthodox numbering are different because we use different translations for the same texts. 
we use a Greek text. And the Greek text has 151 psalms in it. And some of the psalms are broken up slightly different than we have in the Masoretic text of the Hebrew Bible. Just to be really clear, though, the Septuagint in its complete form was finished around 70 years before Jesus was born. 70 years before, the, before Jesus was born. On the other hand, the Masoretic text, the Hebrew Bible, it took forever for it to get finished. It was finished 900 years after the birth of Christ. So almost 1,000 years after Jesus was born is when they finished the, the text that they use today for the Hebrew Bible. That Hebrew Bible is the one that Martin Luther said, oh, we should use that instead of the Septuagint because Hebrew is older than Greek. Well, okay, but there were a lot of changes in those 900 years. So, you know, it's not really something I'm going to get into a lot, but um, you can't discount the importance of the Greek text in understanding the Old Testament. There are actually whole sections of the Hebrew Bible that are missing and mistranslated. Um, there's a line, I can't remember, it might be in Isaiah, but I can't remember for sure. Um, that is a, a total line. They, they actually skipped a line in their text. So it goes from one thought and then just immediately jumps to another without completing the first. Um, but you can find it in the Greek because it's there. It's a mistake. Because like I said, I mean, the idea doesn't even complete itself. It's just kind of, it's like someone's talking and they stop and miss. And then they go on to something else, mm -hmm. right? It's like that. And that's not usual for, oh, and, and that brings up another question or another point about the inerrancy of scripture. Um, how do I put this delicately? Let me put it this way. Remember that the Bible is written for the church. Okay, The church doesn't exist because of the Bible. All right. The Bible is written for the church. It's for us to use, for us to understand who God is and how he related to his people. Okay, it's not a cookbook, it's not a rule book, it's not a, um, and it's not a constitution, it's not anything like that. It is a book that tells us um, stories of the relationship between God and his people. Okay, um, is it inerrant? No, it's not inerrant, and I'll tell you why. Because you can go to something like the Gospel of St. Matthew, and we cannot find the earliest version of the Gospel of St. Matthew. We have versions of it. One is called the Leningrad Codex. Another is um, Sinai Codex. Okay. Those are two different texts that exist roughly at the same time, all written, um, you know, on a piece of, pap of papyrus, right? But there are chunks missing in one that exist in another. And there are, um, there are other whole things that make it impossible for us to say, this text is the one that is correct and the others aren't, right? One thing our church says, you know, when we are dealing with a, a, a story where a man is has his son who has epilepsy, he actually says epilepsy, not a demon, but he keeps falling into the fire, falling into the water to drown himself. And your disciples have tried to help him and they can't. So Jesus gets exasperated and says, how long am I to put up with you? How long am I to deal with you? Bring the child to me. And so they bring him and he heals him. And then his disciples later say, well, how come we can do that? And he says, because this kind of demon can only be removed by prayer and fasting. Well, that and fasting exists only in portions of those papyrus and not all of them. So some of them just say can be removed by prayer. That's why in the Protestant world, they say, well, we like that version better. So let's forget about the fasting part and we'll just go to the prayer. Okay. Or, you know, the story of the um, woman who's about to be stoned and Jesus says that the one who is without sin cast the first stone doesn't exist in the oldest texts of the gospel of John. Okay. But it's certainly an important part of the Bible, right? Okay. How about the conclusion of Mark's resurrection? Same thing. Oldest text doesn't exist, but it does enough. I mean, we can see it and, um, and you know, we have versions that do show it. So all this isn't meant to destabilize anything. It's just to get you to realize that the church has persevered through all of this. And the Bible itself, as we understand it, even our version of the Bible, 
with all of its various texts and everything else, um, it reached its final form around 600 AD. Okay, so and they certainly had stories and accounts that, that existed in, in times earlier than that. But the Bible in its fullness that we have today was not known until about 600 AD. And it was finalized in Latin before it was finalized in Greek. Okay. Um, why do I say all this? Why do I be belabor the point so much? Part of it is to recognize that we are part of a living tradition. And this is this is something that is very hard for us Americans to understand because we're a people of writing, okay? We like things written down and we like to say, this is our evidence for this situation or that situation. We like constitutions, we like laws, we like bylaws. Okay, well, that's new. That is a very new way of looking at the world, okay? As Christians, we were great storytellers in the back, back of the lens, okay? Because most everybody was illiterate. And so you had to listen to the stories, right? Imagine if you don't have your own Bible, but the priest comes out and he reads the epistle, he reads the gospel. That's pretty much the exposure that you had to the services, to the to the different words of the service, to the, to the Bible. Now, I'm going to read a couple of things in this Vesper service a little bit later, which shows you some of the theology of the church, which is why it's so important to come to things like Vespers and Matins. Okay, because that's where our theology happens. Albert's been saying it, and I agree 100%. Our best Sunday school is Vespers and Matins or Orthros. Okay, our best information that we are given is then. Sometimes the liturgy does it. Maybe even sometimes you might get it in the sermon. But for the most part, the best theology of the church exists inside the hymnography of those other services, right? Tells you a lot about who we are and what we care about and so forth. Okay, so um, let me take a walk back. Now, I just read, let my prayer be set before thee as incense and lifting up my hands an evening sacrifice. Hear thou me, O Lord. Okay, so... We know that we became estranged from God, okay? And that we groan to be reconciled with him. Well, one of the ways that we can be reconciled is through Levitical sacrifice. That is something that was established between God and his people to offer gifts and sacrifices to God for all sorts of different reasons, okay? If you sinned, you do a sacrifice. If you hurt somebody, you do a sacrifice. If you wanna celebrate something, you do a sacrifice. You have a kid, you do a sacrifice. You have a good dog. You do a sacrifice. I mean, there are all sorts of different things that just bring you to want to offer that gift and sacrifice to God. Okay. And so what we have here is a hearkening back on the part of the, the writer of the psalm that our prayers are also like the incense that exists in God's kingdom. So it's an offering that we are making. Our prayers are an offering that we make to God praying that those things will be acceptable in his sight and that he will find in return the des not desire, but the good measure to, to deliver what it is that we are seeking um, through the petitions that we are offering. Okay. All right. So, yes, please. So would you kind of say then that instead of having the traditional sacrifices of the Old Testament, yes. our sacrifices now are prayers? Um, partly, but also is our liturgy, okay? Because there's one sacrifice, and we'll talk about this when we get into the divine liturgy, but there's one sacrifice that we offer now that we used to offer in the past, and that's it. There used to be many, many others, like I said, but what Christ did on the cross wiped out all the needs for those other sacrifices, Okay, it's about um, that's told in the epistle to the Hebrews. But the one sacrifice that we can make and should make as often as we can is the Eucharist. It's a sacrifice of thanksgiving. Okay, so yes, our prayers are a form of sacrifice. Um, but more importantly, the sacrifice of thanksgiving is still appropriate to make. And we do that through offering bread and wine and Christ through the Holy Spirit, makes them into his body and blood. Okay. All right. Other questions? Anyone out there have questions? OK. 
Okay, we'll keep going. So the next line, set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth and a protecting door round about my lips. This is all still Psalm 142, 141, 140, goodness, 140. Okay. Incline not my heart to evil words, to make excuses and sins with men that work iniquities, and I will not communicate with the choicest, the best of them. The just man shall correct me in mercy and shall reprove me, but don't let the oil of the sinner anoint my head. Okay, and so on and so forth. So all of this is just that establishing of our relationship with God, but also our understanding that life is tough and that we are in need of God, that we need this kind of, the, that our enemies more or less are all around us and we need to do whatever we can to avoid them. And God alone is the one who can deliver us from these kinds of things. Okay, so I invite you to take um, the text home with you, those that are here. Take a look at this text and read it. And you can see there's an urgency to all of this. Um, and maybe the urgency is greater than what we face in our daily lives. But if you remove the physical of it and replace it with the spiritual struggles that we go through every day, you can see that there are similarities here. It's analogous. Okay, Our spiritual struggles are one where we fight constantly against the temptations and the diverse and subtle snares of the devil. Okay, And so you can see when we have, if you think about these things, the devil is secretly laying these snares for us. Okay, He's, oh, you've been really proud of what you do. Here, let me put a little trap here. We become so absorbed in how good you are that you forget all these other things, you know, I mean, it happens all the time. You know, you grow overly confident in something. And next thing you know, um, you're, you're hurting other people because you're not really thinking about their situation. You're just, um, you're just proud of what you do. I mean, these, these kinds of things happen all the time. And so this is meant to be a physical thing, but it's also meant to be a spiritual thing that we're always pursued by the devil to pull us away from the things that really matter. All right, so if you move down to verse six, O Lord, if thou should mark iniquities, who shall stand? For with thee there is forgiveness. Okay, that is profound and true. You know, think about it this way. You know, think about how we judge either ourselves or other people. And if someone does something wrong, how quickly are we to forgive them? If someone really hurts us, how quickly are we to forgive them? Okay. And then take that and compare it with what God does. Because God's infinite in mercy, forgiveness, and compassion. Okay. So if, if the Lord would mark iniquities, if you remember everything, then we would be in big trouble. But he wipes those things clean as long as we hold on to him as long as we seek after him and wish to um, be with him right so um so that's a verse from the psalm but then we have the verse that's not in italics so it says lord the apostles hast thou truly enlightened so um i love no i don't this kind of english but um what is he saying Oh, Lord, you gave, you enlightened your apostles, okay, um, with the good comforter's radiance. Um, this is a hearkening of Pentecost, okay, when the tongues of flame lighted on the head of the apostles. Good comforter is another name for the Holy Spirit. Setting them like lights in the heavens. Now, this is the disciples' apostles. This isn't the tongues of flame anymore. They have gone out into the world and preached the gospel and done sorts of all sorts of miraculous things, making the whole world exceedingly bright with the clear spiritual light of the knowledge of thee as the Lord. It's a beautiful little prayer right there. Wherefore, O Master, we praise and worship thy great goodness and beneficence. I love those big words. Okay. So it's just a giving thanks to God for the apostles, right? But this is stuck within the service of Vespers. Now, I said at the beginning that the Vespers is an Old Testament service. It's talking about the groaning that we have, the yearning for God, the darkening of the night sky. I mean, all that's part of Vespers, okay? But remember, we're Christians, okay? 
And we know how the story ends. So everything, <laughs> regardless of where it stands within history, everything points to Christ from a Christian's perspective. Everything points to Christ. Okay. So Adam's fall, the necessity of Christ. David and Bathsheba, the necessity of Christ, because David can't overcome the lusts of the flesh except through Christ. Okay. The Messiah, the quest for the Messiah, well, that only gets addressed again in Christ becoming the one and only true Messiah. All of all of the Old Testament groans for the need of being saved, and Christ is the one who saves. So even in Vespers, even though it is largely an Old Testament um, kind of a service, a pre-incarnation um, type of a service, it um, still remains as um, um, as a Christocentric thing because everything in the church is seen through the lens of Christ. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. okay. So the next one, Lord, with thy wise apostles, bold intercessions, thou ever wallest thy flock about, saving it from strife and from factions and from affrontery of enemies. Boy, that's a lot. Let's put it another way. All right. With the prayers of the saints, you build a wall around your church, your flock, saving it from strife, from enmity, and from factions. Oh, if only that were true. I mean, that's the goal. If we live into the reality of the church, there's no room for factions. Factions come from outside, not from inside. The desire for control, pride over ethnicity, politics, these things serve as wedges, as divisors, as factions. Okay? But if we follow Christ with a singular desire to just be with Christ, don't to worry about anybody of this. All right. For with own precious blood, O Savior, thou hast purchased the church, and as compassionate, you have freed it from its bondage to the alien. Who's the alien? The devil. Okay. Verse four, from the morning watch until night, from the morning watch that Israel trust in the Lord. Again, a reading from that Psalm. I think at this point we have moved from Psalm 140 to Psalm 141. We read them consecutively. Okay, but here's another prayer. And this one has a specific name attached to it. Lord, by the readily received and divine prayers of the divine hierarch Nicholas, free from every peril and evil, from wanton spite and all misery. Thy faithful servants, O Lord, worship with undoubting faith, thine all incomparable dominion and thy mighty power, O friend of man. All right, so what's there? Um, we will talk about this again in the future. I'm not gonna expect you to memorize this, but every day of the week has a special attachment to it, okay? Um, we remember a particular saint or event every day of the week. The first we'll say is Monday, angels, okay? So with Monday, we remember the holy angels. Tuesday, we remember John the Baptist. Wednesday, we remember our Lord's betrayal. That's why we fast. Thursday, we remember St. Nicholas of Myra in Lycia. That's why we're remembering Nicholas in this particular hymn, okay? Okay. Friday, his crucifixion. Saturday, all those who have died. Sunday, our Lord's resurrection. And there you are. So, Thursday? No, Thursday was St. Nicholas. St. Nicholas. Saint Nicholas. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, I, we're looking at Wednesday Vespers, which is okay. really the first service of Thursday. Okay. okay. Right. So, again, angels, John the Baptist, the betrayal of our Lord on Wednesday, so hence fast number one. St. Nicholas, the crucifixion, hence fast number two, okay? Then Saturday, because our Lord is buried on Saturday in the tomb, we remember the souls of the departed. So every Saturday, we could have a Saturday of the souls, every one of them. And if you went to the monastery and you heard them sing the troparia um, of the day, one of them is with the saints, O Lord, give rest to the souls of the departed where there's no suffering, sorrow, and sighing, but life everlasting. Forgive me for reading that so fast. But 
it's the remember, it's the prayer that we actually say in the funeral service when we're talking about those who have departed this life. Okay. Um, and let's look at that. Well, we'll talk about that later too. Okay. So Saturday, remember those in the grave. And then Sunday, remember resurrection, right? Every Sunday, the exception of major, major holidays like Transfiguration or Palm Sunday, those, um, we remember our Lord's resurrection every Sunday. That's why even in Lent, we wear bright colors on Sunday. We're supposed to. We really wanted to do it right. We would change all the altar cloths to gold just for Sunday. And then Sunday night, we would change them back to dark colors. Okay, and then we remember Saint Caratina. I'll have to remember to send her a happy name day, Mother Caratina over at the monastery. So this is a saint of the day, right? So tomorrow, October 5th, is the day that we remember Saint Caratina, right? So we sing a hymn to her. With much patience didst thou endure, great torment with the sharpest pain. Oh my gosh. When thy teeth and nails were torn out by the roots. Yes, you do learn a lot in these hymns. And as the namesake of joy hast thou in joy now departed hence to the heavenly abode. And the bride chamber found on high where thou didst desire that thy citizenship should be. O August prize winner Caratina, thou virgin martyr of many crowns. Um, that is one unfortunate thing that we have to face in the life. Again, not only are we blessed with giant eagle, sparkle, all these, and, and save a lot, but we're also, when we talk about persecution, what do we talk about? We're persecuted because they do sports on Sunday morning. We're persecuted because they don't let prayer in school. We're persecuted because they don't let me speak freely in a public square. Well, I mean, they sort of do, but they ignore me. But those aren't persecutions, okay? They're difficulties, they're challenges, they're things that we have to figure out how to overcome, okay? Persecution is when they pull your fingernails and your teeth out by their roots, okay? As they just, sorry, that was gross. But I mean, there are all sorts of really horrible things that they used to inflict on Christians. That's persecution. You know, if, if you really want to know something horrible, not to brag about it, and I'm not trying to brag about it, but read about the life of St. George, okay? Poor St. George. I mean, they tried every means possible to kill him, and he still didn't die. Every possible means. They hurt him so many different ways that he endured it all, okay? Because he believes. And, I mean, there is that whole thing that the creation itself is holy and beautiful because God created it, but it is not the end of us. We don't stop with the world and say, that's it. We want the world that is eternal and beautiful and has no hurricanes, tornadoes, forest fires, flames, famines, flies, lantern flies, and so on. Okay. We want the place that is free of all of those things that cause adversity and pain and sorrow. That's what we say in that great hymn, a reading where there is no more sickness, no more sorrow, no more sighing, but life everlasting. That's our true home. That's where we belong. Okay. But we don't want to stop here and say, well, I hate this world and I can't wait to be done with it. Because we have the capability of taking our light that Christ has given us and shining it a little bit on this world and bringing some of that light of Christ into this place. And when we do that, the things that Christ himself has made will resonate with that love. I mean, think about it. You go outside and you see a harvest moon. And you just, it's so beautiful, right? It's not ugly. It's not horrible. It's like, oh, I can't wait to stop looking at that harvest moon. It's not bad, okay? So the light that you have in you, that Christ has given you through your baptism and through your constant practice of the faith enables you to see things out in the world and enable you to have a little bit of gratitude to God for these beautiful things. I mean, you could even do that driving down... 279 going into Pittsburgh. Okay. Because as you come down, you see all the buildings open up, especially in the wintertime, all the humidity's gone and everything's just bright and shiny and lighted up and everything. So beautiful, right? Well, even that can cause us to give thanks to God. Thank you, God, that we are intelligent creatures 
and that we have the ability to do these things that are truly beautiful. But without him, we couldn't do nothing. Anything. Excuse me. Okay. So all of that said, we know if we push too hard, even in a country like this one that claims to be tolerant and full of freedoms, if we push too hard, we will be clamped. Okay. Um, and I don't want to go too far on this, but I do want to make another point. And that is, you know, I'm hearing right now a lot of pushes for prayer in school. Okay. Um, I don't want that. I know that's shocking, but I'll tell you why I don't. I don't want that because it's not going to be me or some other priest who's going to be offering the prayer. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's going to be someone probably from the first church of what's happening now. Okay. The first evangelical church on the left of the corner. Okay. And they're going to use their language and their resources to do to us what they did in the past to our ancestors. Okay which is they convict Orthodox Christians of lack of knowledge. They don't know the Bible enough. They feel insufficient. And they're dragged to these churches where all of a sudden they stop being Orthodox and they become something else. Okay. I don't, I don't like, I don't like schools being used as a platform for converting people. Okay. Let the kids, whoever they are, learn. Okay but let them pray with their family and their church. Okay. Let them pray with their family and their church and leave it out of the schools. Let the kids learn how to be good Christians in the church and at home, and then let them go and be good Christians in the schools. That's what I prefer. Okay. America is not built to be Orthodox just yet. When it is orthodox, then let's do it. Until then, let's be humble. And, you know, I mean, obviously tell your kids, yes, by all means, at all times, pray. Okay? I don't care if you're in a class, pray. Not out loud. <laughs> okay? But be mindful that God is with you all at all times. All right? So I know that's a little bit controversial, but I... My problem is that we are 0.4 and shrinking percent of the U.S. population. 0.4% of the U.S. population. Okay. Until we're like 10% of the U.S. population. And I don't know when that will be. I'm working on it. But until we are there, then I think we need to just be humble and stick to our guns. We need to be who we are and, and don't let people take our kids away even though we have issues with sports all right does that make sense you know what i'm saying yep okay so going back to the situation of saint caratina if we push too hard we're gonna find ourselves persecuted you can think in our day of um, the christians that were murdered on the shores of libya when isis was doing their thing okay that was horrible i mean it was really horrible um and it, and it tell we tell the story of a witness seeing what was about to happen and he gets in line with them so if you look at they have icons of this now this happened within the last 10 years mm -hmm. and if you look at the icons they're like all they all look like except one okay and one's a little bit different and that's because he saw what they were going to do and he he showed his love for christ because they were willing to go he went with them and they killed them all right there on the shores of the mediterranean Okay. So we do face these kinds of persecutions. It does happen. Right. And so poor St. Caratina here, but she has received, we believe with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength that she has received a reward that is far greater than any suffering that we face on earth. Okay. Does that make sense? It's heavy stuff, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. But see, this is, this is, Another anecdote, I used to do this to my kid. I used to make her go to all our funerals and stuff. I did. Now she doesn't go to church anymore for right now, but but I didn't want to hide these things away from her. I don't want people just to think that church is full of just 
happy moments. I want them to see the beautiful moments. I, I hope I preach that for the most part. But I want us to understand that God is with us just as much in adversity and persecution as he is when everything's going our way. Because there are Christians who believe that when things aren't going your way, then obviously there's something wrong with you. Okay, the whole prosperity gospel is based on the idea that you're poor because either you did something wrong or God just wants you to be poor. That's, um, I can't say what that is. But let's just say it's not true. <laughs> okay, it's not true. And yet these people build an entire enterprise, literally, over this kind of message. And because they say it and because people want to hear it, they, they reward upon reward upon reward these people. You know, I still can't get over Kenneth Copeland and his five jets. Yeah. Five jets. What does one guy need with five personal airplanes? Oh, and by the way, you can't pray in coach, he says. All right. I'm not going to read the rest of these um, hymns for, to, for St. Caratina. Um, except, well, no, this is the last one. And this is to the mother of God, the Theotokian um, in the fourth tone, the very last thing before O gladsome light. So, O immaculate bride of God, thou art truly the gentle calm and the waveless port of salvation, bright with peace for us, who fiercely are tossed upon this sea filled with miseries of life's sore adversities, for which reason we flee to thee and we all cry out, never cease to stand by us, but forevermore protect us and preserve us who are thy servants and suppliants. That's lovely. Okay. That's a really beautiful hymn. And I love the imagery. Now, when we walk into that church space over there and you look up, what does it remind you of? A boat. Doesn't it? Kind of looks like a boat. Like Noah's Ark, maybe. How we would imagine Noah's Ark would look like. Okay. The mother of God, Mary, the Theotokos, is the great and gentle, calm, and waveless port of salvation. Okay. We are boat captains. And we have to navigate through all of these different things. Now, when we're driving our happy little cars, especially like at the very beginning of the summer, and we get those thunderstorms, right? And the rain starts hitting so heavy that we can't even see, right? We can't even see what's in front of us. We have to slow down. We pull over. We pray that it ends. And thank God it does. doesn't last forever. Imagine being on a boat that happened. You ever been on a boat during really choppy waves? It's not very fun. And it's, it's actually kind of scary, you know, especially now, you know, when these hymns were written, it was centuries ago. So wooden boats, sails, no motors. Okay. Imagine that, right? And they're like this, and you know, they're just going back and forth and back and forth and, like getting seasick and all that horrible stuff. But there's the mother of God. Okay. So we are here and we force our boat into that calm and waveless port. Okay. That's the image here. Okay. This waveless port. That's exactly what you want. You want a glassy sea where it's just easy to just bring your boat calmly and smoothly to your destination. I mean, that's what we always long for, even, you know, when you're on a boat. So she is that port of salvation, bright with peace for us. She's our mother. She's our, our true mother. Okay. And her existence brings about that calm that we yearn for. You know, us poor souls who are fiercely tossed upon the fill seas filled with miseries of life's sore adversities. Gosh, what kind of adversities can we have? You know, there are all sorts. And and again, I mean, just what I was saying, the prosperity gospel would look at something like this and say, nah, Jesus, you know, and if you don't, 
if if you don't hold on to Jesus, you're you're you know you're confused or whatever. No, it's it's we will flee unto her and to him because they do bring about that calm and 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 peace that the world itself cannot give us. It wants to, but it has no capacity to do that. Never cease to stand by us, but forevermore protect and preserve us. Who are thy servants and the ones we're praying to? Suppliants. Okay. So we have these hymns in the middle of Vespers um, that help us to focus our attention on what truly matters. The one thing to drive home about these services, all these services, is that everything is Christocentric. This is theology, okay? There's nothing fluffy about it. In fact, I mean, these are pretty intense, right? Um, it's it's not meant to be fluffy. It's not meant to, um, to be, um, what's the word? like the stuff in elementary in for an elementary school, you know, like when, when you're trying to teach someone who's really super young, you try to use calm, you know, words that aren't unsettling and, 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 and simple and all of that. Right. Well, that's not this, this, our faith is like in our face. Okay. And it's okay because life is in our face. I mean, think about that. You know, why wouldn't our church, why wouldn't our faith be just as intense as the life that we live? but in a different direction to show us that life truly exists within the life of the church, more so than the, the stuff of the world. If we think about it seriously, you know, the world says the church doesn't have anything to offer um, for the suffering that happens, but yeah, we actually do. You know, we understand it. We understand the concept of suffering. Some of us have been through it directly. The majority of us come from families that came into this um, into this country and faced adversity as soon as they set or you know foot on the ground. You know, Greeks, sure, Russians, absolutely, Syrians for sure. Okay, maybe us converts didn't have it as bad, but because we already established here. But the majority of people who came needed the church as their refuge, you know, because to be honest, I mean, think of the 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 terms that we used in Newcastle back in the day, right? You've got your cookie eaters on one side and you got your cake eaters on the other side, right? Sounds kind of cute, but it's not. It's meant to be offensive, okay? It is. It's meant to be offensive. And someone, you know, from the Syrian church would go you know, downtown away from the south side. And they would say, what are you doing here? You know, you got your shops down there. What are you, what are you here for? You know? They you called know. Them names. Sure did. Well, they're still calling them names. I was talking to somebody recently about just some of the abusive names that even today people call um other you know like there was one class i'm not going to talk about but it was really highly offensive and it just happened within the last five years yeah we haven't quite gotten it over over ourselves just yet okay. well it's it's everywhere it's our leaders and everything use those offensive words you're absolutely right marilyn it's true and and that is um that's a time when we have to realize that we've got to rise above some of those other people, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I've always found that we as Americans emulate our president. I don't know if you've had that experience, but we look to that one person and they tend to lead us in a direction, unless you really can't stand them so much that it just is impossible. But, you know, <laughs> I think, again, I think it just drives home the point that we as Christians need to remember to whom we belong. Mm -hmm. And when we do that, then we don't let the circumstances around us dictate our approach to how we deal with things. We deal with things because we know as Christians, this is what we do. It's not, it's not easy, but that's why we take care of each other. That's the centrality of the church. 
we are together here to lift each other up, not to criticize, not to judge, not to say, hey, you should have been fasting. That's not your problem. But it is our problem when someone is suffering, we do what we can to help them. When someone is lost, we do what we can to navigate them back to where they need to be. We don't judge, we don't criticize, but we guide and we shepherd, we mentor, we love, we respect. That's what we are to do in the church. And so that comment about factions that we saw earlier, if we could eliminate that, think about that. If we could just eliminate that, if everyone in the church could strip away all their political and, and every other thing that serves to separate them from other people within the church and just yeah. bound themselves as Christians together to promise to take care of one another, then it wouldn't matter what you believe because you know that you could trust the people that were here because that's who we are, okay? That's what the church is supposed to be. The problem is we come here once, twice, three times a week, and it's really hard to take that message and carry it through how many of our hours are, 108 hours in a week? I, don't, I can't remember. It's a lot. Okay. We can't, it, it's hard for us to keep that focus and continuity without continual reinforcement. So that's what we should do. We should continually reinforce, uplift each other, talk to each other. Stay in contact with each other. Pray for each other. That's the best thing you can do. Pray for each other. Yeah. Okay. So, Vespers, continuing on and wrapping up. So, Vespers is this service that takes us on a short little ride from the beauty of Eden into the harsh reality of the, rea of the world in which we live now, except for one thing. We have Christ they did not. They yearned for him. They longed for him. They pined for him. They groaned for him, but they did not have him. Yeah. Okay. So then we have right smack in the middle of Vespers, the hymn Gladsome Light. Okay. So this is what we sing right after we've completed these other hymns that I've just been reading. So I'll read that out loud. O gladsome light of the holy glory of the immortal, heavenly, and blessed Father. O Jesus Christ, lo, now that we have come to the setting of the sun, and as we behold the evening light, we hymn thee, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. For it is meet appropriate um, to uh, meet it is for thee at all times to be magnified by joyous voices O son of god and giver of life wherefore the whole world doth glorify thee okay so let me translate that into english so we are aware that the sun is setting we are aware that the darkness is going to grow we are aware that instead of the great sun in the sky we will have moon and stars and torch light or fluorescent light bulbs Okay, but nevertheless, we continue to worship Father, Son, and Holy Spirit because it's appropriate to do that at all times and in every hour. Magnify, to amplify that praise so all of us joining together. You ever noticed when one person sings, it's kind of quiet. When two people sing, it gets louder. Think about that. And when 100 people sing, it's almost deafening, even though everyone's singing at the same volume. That's one of the remarkable things about our voices and the way that they function. You would think that because I'm speaking in this thing and everyone spoke the same way, it would just be the same volume, but it's not. It amplifies. And that's what we're called to do. We're called to take our voices, add them to the angels who are already singing praises to God, and creating this thunderous sound of both the celestial, those in heaven, and the terrestrial, us on earth, together singing praises to God, even in the midst of the groaning, because we know how the story ends. We know that even in the darkness, God is to be praised. Even in the darkness, right? There's this amazing hymn called Glory to God for All Things. It was written by a guy in a concentration camp, looking out his window and beholding beauty amidst the bars of the torture that he was facing. 
the Akathis itself is stunning in just how beautiful it is. The monastery does it at every Thanksgiving, and we might do it too somehow. Um, but it's the same thing. Even in the midst of that, there is still that beauty that we hold on to because we know who God is and how much he loves us. No, that's your son. Okay, <laughs> so then just to wrap up, so what we've been saying in the midst of all of this is how creation is groaning, right? Well, there's this beautiful little hymn right at the very end of Vespers, okay, which tells us what's coming, right? The very beginning of the Gospel of St. Luke, we have the narrative account of Jesus's birth. And one of the things he has to do is be presented to the temple because that's just what obedient Jews do. And so when he goes to the temple with his mom and dad, because he's only 40 days old, when he goes to the temple with his mom and dad, there is a man there who has been waiting for the Messiah to come. God promised that he will come, but you will not die until you see him. <clears throat> and as soon as Simeon sees Jesus, he says, that's it. And he sings this hymn, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For my eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people, Israel. So at the very end of Vespers, even though we have this darkness of creation in the fall, and this creation that is groaning for our deliverance from this darkness and this suffering, we have Christ incarnate in the arms of a prophet who knew that this 40-year-old babe is the Messiah that will save us all. And so that's how we conclude Vespers. We conclude it with that hopeful awareness that Christ is coming. Indeed, Christ has come and will deliver us from all of this adversity. <laughs> Pretty cool, huh? Pretty cool. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful class. Thank you. All right. Any questions, anybody? Any comments, concerns? All right. Well, God bless you. Thank you very much for being a part of it tonight. And God Thank willing, you. We'll pick up. I want to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, two weeks from now, I will not be here. Okay. Because I have to be at a clergy retreat. But next week we will meet and we'll talk about compline and the different things that happen there. Okay. Look, prayers. Okay. Thank you. All right. Good night. Thank you. Nice.